Will the rock take my place? Uh, and that's the truth. Uh, before we bring our speaker up, um, I'd like to say to you that um, um, our brother's coming not just as a uh, pulpit supply, but also uh, as a candidate for mission support. So I want you to keep that uh, uh, in your thinking. Also, it was, uh, I was reminded that since he was here last, um, there's been quite a few uh, new people join our church. So as I said this morning, I would like to uh, introduce to some and present to others our brother, William Payne. Let's bring him up. Good morning. It's good to be back at Bible Baptist Church. I want to, first of all, thank Pastor Lavender. I know he's not here today, but I don't remember, but six years ago, well, it's been longer than that, but in 2009, uh, he brought me here as the uh, first uh, pastor in training here. We lived in that house right over there, and uh, we were here for three years, and um, he taught me many things, and uh, sometimes when you... Uh, when people are telling you something, older people, you know, they're telling you things and you think, yeah, you don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but as time goes on, you realize they knew what they were talking about. Uh, Pastor Lavender knows what he's talking about, and uh, I appreciate him. Uh, and one thing that stood out to me is that he told me, when you're involved in ministry, make sure that you love your wife and your children and don't, le and don't uh, lose them. And that is something I have carried with me uh, throughout my time, and so I appreciate him for that. I also remember many of all, everybody who's seniors and so on in high school, they were little when we were here. Um, my oldest daughter, if you remember, her name was Alexandria. Um, she's uh, 18 now. She graduated this past year in 2018, and uh, she accepted a volleyball scholarship to the University of Albany, and so she is there, and they were actually playing at Michigan State this weekend. So it kind of worked out for me to be able to come out here and see her and get to enjoy her. It's been a great time. She, she's done very well athletically, and she trained in those fields right over there in that house. In that backyard, she ran and she jumped, and so I, we're very grateful to Bible Baptist Church for that. My son Marcus, uh, who was young then, he's 15 now. Um, he plays football. He's his class president, and uh, he has, uh, gives us great joy. Um, Alexandria and Marcus were both baptized here at Bible Baptist Church, so it's always uh, been a blessing to us. And then our youngest, Victoria, she is 12 now. She was a three-year-old here. And uh, so there are so many memories probably the, uh, that come from here. We have in my office at home and in my office, there's a picture of myself and uh, Carl Crawford walking and Marcus and Canaan. They played Pop Warner together, and it was the year that they, uh, they won their little league championship. So anybody who comes around me, they always ask me, who is that guy in the picture? Uh, like, that's Carl Crawford. Well, who's the dude in front of me? Oh, that's Kanan Crawford, and Kanan don't look like that no more. He's about five times the size now, so it's always time has gone by fast. Uh, many have asked, uh, how's my wife doing? Um, she's doing well. Um, and I, Earlier during Sunday school, I told everyone that in April of this year, uh, our kids, they give everyone an Easter basket, my wife does, and she gave me a basket, and it had this little onesie in there, and it said, hold me close and tell me you love me, and so I looked at it, and I was like, why are you giving me this, and she said, did you read it? I read it, and I said, do you need a hug, so I gave her a hug. Uh, she said, no, look at it again, and so on Easter Sunday, I found out that we were having another little girl um, to be due in December of this year, December 3rd, so... Um, she is, uh, she's not allowed to fly, uh, and so that's why uh, she couldn't be here today, but uh, she sends her greetings, and uh, we're just very grateful to be here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 14 and 15, and we'll be talking about evangelism. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. You read them earlier, I'd like to read them again. And he reads, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? 
And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how they can preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word, Father. I pray that you'll be honored and glorified by what is said. And I pray that we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Romans is the Apostle Paul writing to fellow believers uh, who are really in the midst of some difficult times. And as you know, in the early church, there were two types of, well, there, were all, there was all one group of believers, but you had the Jewish believers who believed that the Gentile believers had to live according to the Jewish law. And Paul here in this text, he's going to make it quite clear, like he says in verse 12 of Romans chapter 10, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And in this, these verses, we'll look at the, uh, the context here. He's talking about evangelism. Evangelism is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. And I believe that in this text, we will see three truths about evangelism. The first one is, there are people who have not heard the gospel message. He says, and how can they call on the one they have not believed? But then he says, how can they believe if they haven't heard? You cannot believe something that you have not heard about. There are people, we know that there are people all across the globe who have not heard about Jesus Christ. I serve as a trustee on the International Mission Board uh, for the Southern Baptist Convention. I represent the state of New York, and we have 4,000 missionaries all throughout the globe. The goal of our missions, uh, the mission board is to see the gospel message taken to different countries and places where the gospel has not been reached. Right now, they say there are over 1,600 countries where people have not heard about Jesus Christ. But even as you think about that, if you think about here in America, we realize even though that there are Bibles all over the place and you can turn the TV on and see TV preachers, there are people who have not heard about Jesus Christ. The gospel message is simply that Jesus Christ came to this earth as a baby. He grew up, he died on the cross for the sins of mankind. He rose from the, third, from the grave on the third day and presently sits at the right hand of the Father. When a person believes in their heart and they confess their sin and trust in Christ alone for salvation, then they are saved. Now the mandate here, as we talk about evangelism, we know that the Great Commission is that we are to go out and make disciples. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are now a disciple. And your job, whether uh, the pastor told you, your deacon, your job is to go out and share the gospel message. Who do you share it with? You share it with individuals who have not heard. Now, we like to, we come around and people have issues in their life. People have issues with their marriages. People have issues with their finances. People have issues with gossip and lying and all those different things. The solution to helping someone who is struggling in their marriage, first of all, is to find out, do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because a husband cannot love his wife the way she's supposed to be loved unless he knows the one who invented love, God himself. A wife cannot follow her husband and love him unless she knows the one who invented love, who is the author of marriage. You say you got people who are struggling uh, with their finances. You're never going to know how to handle your money the right way unless you know the one who gave you the money. You say, well, you know, I, my, my friend, people, this person over here, they're always lying and gossiping. They're doing all these, these sinful things. Those individuals, if they do not know Christ, if they have not heard the message, all they're going to do is sin. What do dogs do? Dogs bark. Cats meow. Pigs oink and roll in the mud. And they do all those things, and you still eat that, that, that bacon. What do you think about that? A pig eat anything, but you still love that bacon, don't you? It is good. <laughs> but, but they do what they do. What does a sinner do? A sinner is going to do what a sinner does. So when you, when you have this, when you have these issues, when people are having these struggles in their life, the first thing you need to know is, does this individual know Christ? And then when you find that out, then you have to make sure that you tell them about the message. You know, there are so many people who you can go to a church. This is sad. You can go to a church. You can watch TV churches. You can read a book. 
but you may not hear the gospel message. The church is, a, is made up of believers. The church is a group of people who believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he, says what he, he said what he said in the book, that he rose again, and that they believe in him and trust in him for salvation alone. That's the body of believers. Any person who does not understand that, they cannot, they cannot live life the proper way. Now, it doesn't mean you say, well, I got, I got unbelieving friends who they have a whole bunch of money, they got nice cars, and they look happy. Well, let me tell you something. Looks can be deceived. You know that individual who has a whole bunch of money? You may have a whole bunch of money, but you know what the problem is with having a whole bunch of money? You got to worry. You got to worry about who's going to take your money. Oh, you don't want to lose money. When you're broke, you ain't got nothing to worry about. It's life is life. You know, you got that money, boy. You get that check. Oh, man, you just worry. You know, it's like, it's like when you get that money and your kids, and you got kids or grandkids, and they need something. And you're like, man, honey, we're going to have this extra money. And you be like, look, Jimmy John needs some new shoes. Oh. And you know Jimmy John don't just want no regular shoes. He wants the LeBrons or the KDs that cost two fifty, and you got to go get the other other Lonzo balls. Don't buy those. But people do it, <laughs> and they show because they do those things. Things come up, but it all goes back to when it comes to your money and so on. Have they heard the message? You and I, we have to get to the point that evangelism becomes something we do every day. When we go out, we have to look around. When some, we have an issue with someone, the question we have to ask is, does that person know Jesus Christ? Have they even heard the message? Because so many times we assume that everyone has heard the message. We think that just because we live in America, that everybody knows about Jesus, they choose not to follow him. The truth is, there are many people who have not heard. And guess who God put on this earth to tell them? He puts you. Now think about this. You come to church. We come to church every week. Have you ever asked yourself this question? How many people that come to my church, your church would be Bible Baptist Church, have come because I went and told them about Jesus Christ and they accepted? Have I been a person in the church who has been out there because God put you on your job? He gave you the neighborhood you live in. He gave you your vacation spots. So when you are out there, you have the opportunity to tell people about Jesus Christ. Don't, 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 don't ever think that it's all about you getting rest and relaxation. It's all about people coming to know him. He says here, how can they believe they have not heard? And he says, how can they hear without someone preaching? The second thing we learn is God uses people. He uses believers to tell others about him. There's a story Billy Graham talks about I want to share with you. He says, I was speaking at an open-air crusade in Nova Scotia. Billy Graham was to speak the next night and had arrived a day early. He came incognito and sat on the grass at the rear of the crowd. Because he was wearing a hat and dark glasses, no one recognized him. Directly in front of him sat an elderly gentleman who seemed to be listening intently to my presentation. When I invited people to come forward as an open sign of commitment, Billy decided to do a little personal evangelism. He tapped a man on the shoulder and asked, would you like to accept Christ? I'll be glad to walk down with you if you want to. The old man looked him up and down thought it over for a moment, and then said, nah, I think I'll just wait till the big gun comes tomorrow night. Billy and I have had several good chuckles over that incident. Unfortunately, it underlies how in the minds of many people, evangelism is the task of the big guns, not the little shots. He says here, how can they go without, being, without a preacher? Somebody telling them, I'm here to tell you that God uses people. This, this thing of evangelism, see, and sometimes in the church, because the pastor comes, we think it's the job of the pastor to be the evangelist. It's the job of the deacons to be the evangelist. No, it's the job of every individual from the, th the three-year-old, the four-year-old, to be an evangelist to tell people about Jesus Christ. 
They've done surveys that say, millions of surveys that say approximately 98% of Christians do not regularly introduce others to the Savior. See, Christ met unbelievers where they were. He realized what many Christians today still don't seem to understand. Cultivators must get out in the field. According to one count, the gospel records 132 contacts that Jesus had with people. Six were in the temple, four in the synagogues, and 122 were out with people in the mainstream of life. All that means is that he said, how can they know without a preacher? That means once again that you're out there and, and, and on your job and whatever you do, when, when the boss is acting up and, and it's time to be at work at 8 o'clock, you're showing up at 7.50. And they say, why are you always here at 7.50? You said, man, I don't, I, you know, it's, if it was up to me, I wouldn't be here at 7.50. I got to be here at 7.50 because I'm a, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ gave me this job and I got to be the best employee I can be. And then can you say, wow, why are you being the best employee? You ain't getting paid enough. It ain't about the money. God provides all my needs. I just want to tell you that I want to show them that I love you. And if you want to know more, let's sit down and talk. He uses people like that. He uses, he uses people who care. You think about your children and so on. Your children are a witness. And you can't tell nobody about Christ and tell them how to live their life. You know, you know people gave you advice about kids and their kids bad? Isn't that the worst? They'd be like, man, this is what I would do. And you look like, man, you, you know, then, you know, somebody want to give you advice about a job and they ain't working 15 years by choice. They ain't sick. They just didn't want to work. But they got all the answers. It's like uh, sometimes I still, uh, you know, I, 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 I talk with uh, Terrence every once in a while. And we're friends, so I can say this. But Terrence, he always, he always wants to talk to me about, he wants to talk about football and stuff. And I'm like, you can't talk to me. You know, everybody knows he's a big Lions fan. Like, they don't win. You don't have the grounds to talk to me about that. Like, I, I really don't want to listen to anything he's saying because he don't know what winning is about. It's, it's different. You know, I want to talk to somebody who got some experience. It's the same thing when you share your faith and so on. People are going to look at you. They're looking, and when you want to talk about their children, you want to tell them how you, as a parent, your number one goal was that your children came to Christ, and they're watching and seeing how do your children add up? What's their life look like? And if it adds up, and it doesn't mean your children have to be perfect, but it means that there's got to be some structure, and they see that you're trying to help them become more like Christ. When we, God, when I say God uses believers, I remember we had left here and we went to Syracuse. Now, you remember when we left, my son had just, they had just won the little Pop Warner Championship. And we go to Syracuse and he goes up there to play football and I meet the coach. And everybody, and you go, they meet you and everybody knows you're a pastor. They're like, oh, Pastor Payne. And I remember they got to their little championship game. And I've been telling people, I'm a pastor, come to our church at Central Baptist, come to Central Baptist, come to Central Baptist. They get to the championship game. And Marcus was a cornerback and a running back, but there was another kid who was running the ball a lot, more than Marcus. So already smoke was coming off my head. Like, give my son the ball. And then the other kid got, he hurt his leg and he started limping, and they were still giving him the ball. And we lost the game, it was like seven to six. So after the game, the coach comes off the field, and I was like, man, you don't know what you're doing. He said, what do you mean? I said, didn't I tell you to give my son the ball? You're terrible. You're terrible. You're terrible. He looked at me like, huh? And he's like, I'm going on and on. I was hot. He's like, at the end, he said, I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Chuck Todd was his name. Ah, get, ah, hit me right there. Ah. I had to go back, apologize. Said the coach, look, man, I get in front of the parents and apologize. I mean, I really messed up. But I, <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that when we say God uses believers, he uses you and I to preach. Our testimony has to be what it's supposed to be. Because I don't know what's, well, everything that goes on in your life. I know that uh, in my own children's life, Alexandria... They say she, she's had a lot of athletic success. But you know what? The number, what I've learned being at Syracuse University and all those different things that all that stuff doesn't matter. The number one thing I want for my daughter is for her to have a heart for Jesus Christ and to walk with him. Because when he says here, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? 
And how can they preach unless they are sent? He's talking, and since he's talking to these believers, you and I, you say, well, nobody, nobody sent me. No one, God sent you because you're a disciple of Christ. He says to go out and make disciples. Now, some people say, well, how do I... You know, how do I do that? I mean, I'm not, I, I, I just can't go out. I just can't go up and talk to people. I, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, what do I say? Well, you say what a person says when they first come to Christ. What happened? I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know, man. All I knew was my life used to stink. It was like this, and now I got some joy in my life. And they said, what does that mean? I don't know. I just know that I believe that Jesus died for me, and I want to be the part of my life. You should get to know him. See, a true heart of compassion will let those on the way to destruction know they can escape, but the only escape is through Jesus Christ. How, if we think about it, how can you tell someone that you love them, truly love them, and you don't tell them the most important truth out there? I've been to many funerals. I've done many funerals. You know what? When everybody gets to the end, the people who come up, you know, people come up and get their little testimonies. I've never seen anybody come up and say, you know, uh, Quantez Joan, man, he, Quantez had $5 million in the bank. Quantez had five nice cars. And I'm just so glad he had those nice cars. You know, people never talk about material things. The only thing they talk about is the character of an individual. They talk about their character and they talk about their love for the Lord if they came to know Christ. And so if you and I say that I love you, I care about you, if you care about your co-workers, if you care about your children, therefore you have a responsibility to tell them the greatest message out there that Jesus Christ died and he wants to have a relationship with you. So many times we get caught up and we want to tell so many other lessons, but we forget to tell them about Christ. When my wife used to get on me all the time because she would always say, you know what? You spend more time doing things with athletics instead of opening a book with your children. You have more devotions. You have Bible studies with everybody else. What about your own kids? And I'll say, well, they're my kids. They'll be okay. And then my son got to ninth grade. And I want to kill that little Negro. I wanna, oh, I want to kill him. <laughs> oh, man. And I love Alexandria. And night, when they got to high school, she got to ninth grade. We sat at the table. I, I, just tell you, I, sat, I looked at her. I said, look here, you can't live here. I said, you're doing that. You ain't going to live here. And you go to your grandparents. I don't care where you go. You ain't going to live here. And I realized, because I used to, she would play her sports. You know, when you get to college, they watch a lot of film. I would take time. I would film her stuff. And we would sit down, and I'd watch every little part of the film. And I would say, your stride is not right, and your arm is not right, and you're not swinging at the ball like this and that. And I would spend hours doing that. I got countless hours of film. And you know what? I didn't take hours to get in the book and tell her, if you say you're a follower of Christ, this is what your not life needs to look like. <laughs> Convicted me. Convicted me. I, and you need to make change. Because when it's all said and done, it's about telling others about she's my daughter I love her I want her to walk with him you want your children and your grandchildren to walk with Christ take the time and share with them he says we need to tell people they're in trouble with God and God alone has to, has provided a way for escape but how do we do that the unbelieving world is made up of a variety of people Young, old, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, urban, different races, personalities, values, politics, and religious backgrounds. It's going to take more than one style of evangelism to reach such a diverse population. So what I want to do is give you a couple styles. So what is your style? The first one would be confrontational. Confrontational. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. This is a Christ has just died, and Peter is now dress, addressing the crowd, the Jews, and he goes through basically a gospel message. And what he says in verses 37 and 38, 
Now when the people heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Paul and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And look what he says in verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In essence, that means that you may be in a situation where you meet someone and, and you're like, look, your life ain't right. You staggering around, your life is terrible, you need to get right, you need to repent. You need Jesus in your life. Confrontational. Now, if you get confrontational with the wrong person, I, I love you. If you get confrontational with the wrong person, you got to know who you're talking to. You come get confrontation with the wrong person, you got to you take that punch for Jesus, right? Confrontation. Secondly is intellectual, Acts chapter 17, intellectual. These are styles of evangelism. These are styles that you can reach people. Confrontational, intellectual, look at Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. This is Paul, verse seven, in, in chapter 17, verse 16, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he is greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. It says, so he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. This means that Paul would get, Paul got into situations were maybe other religious leaders and so on, and he would be able, he would look, and he would explain to them, this is what the Bible means. They were like, what does it mean that Christ died upon the cross? And he would be able to explain to them atonement and so on. He would be able to explain to them, this is what true repentance is. This is what actual faith is. This is how we know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Because back then, many people thought Jesus was just a nice guy who died. They didn't realize that he was the Son of God. Paul was able to explain that. The only way that you can give an intellectual argument about the Bible is you got to study it. Now, I know that I'm not going to speak for him, because, but I know that if you come to Pastor Lavender and you say, I want to study the Bible, I want to know all, everything there is to know about the Bible, either he will help you or he will get you in contact with somebody in the church who could do it for you. You know, people are like, why, do I, why, should I, uh, why do I go to Sunday school? Why do I go to Wednesday night? All those things are to help you get an understanding of the Bible. Now, I don't know if you still do it anymore, but I remember when, when the person joined the church here, this is a little while, this is 2009, and when you joined, you had to, they would come and they would give you, when you, they shake your hand, oh, welcome, brother, hey, oh, yeah, yeah, and then they'd come out the back, and I think it was Brother Long Gee, that big book with a thousand verses, and you're like, oh, carry that mug, and, you know, half fall over, you know, a thousand verses, I don't know if you still do it, but I remember he used to get that book up, and people would be back, be hurt, and so on, but anyway, the point is, he would give you the book with a thousand verses, the point of the book was to get you into the scriptures. Right, the point of the book was so that you would have an understanding of what the book was all about so that when you studied it and got to know it, then when people asked you a question, you could give an intellectual argument of what the Bible is all about. So some people are confrontational, some are intellectual, some are testimonial. Look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9. This is where we, uh, John chapter 9. This is where Jesus... <coughs> Healed the blind man. John chapter 9. Look what he says. Verse 26. Verse 25. We'll start in verse 25. He replied, this is the, fair, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Jesus healed this man. And they asked him a question. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. All the testimonial is simply this. Look, my wife and I, we've been married for 10 years. The marriage was falling apart. It was terrible. And we was going to church, and it wasn't all that it needed to be. But it was when I fully submitted my life to Christ, I learned how to love her. When she fully submitted to Christ, I learned, she learned how to love me. And now we have joy. We had 10 years of pure nonsense, but now we got joy because we submitted to Christ. 
You know, my kids was acting up. I didn't know what to do. My son, he was acting a fool. Oh, boy, he's running around. Every time I see him, he's on the cell phone texting some little girl. I don't know what to do at night. He's running out the window. I didn't know what to do. So I got on my knees and I prayed. And I said, Lord, if you got to smack him upside the head and hit him with the brick, do what you got to do. And then the Lord hit him with the brick. And now the boy, oh, he's my best friend. That's a testimony. Because people, everybody wants to know one thing. How, if you know Christ, how is your life different? If, why would I come to know Christ if your life is just like mine? I'm happy on the outside, but I'm miserable on the inside. You know, it's like, it's like the individuals, you know, when you get up in the morning and you put your makeup on. Oh, you look good. Husband, get, you know, husband, you get up in the morning. Brothers, you got your fresh cut. Spray some black on the gray so it look fresh. Oh, yeah, and everybody, you come to church, your wife know what you look like. You know, she's like, who in the world is that? But Aaron, she know what you look like. No, nobody, you come, you look, you look good. Oh. I remember one time, uh, I told Melinda, you got to be careful. I remember one time, uh, one of our, uh, in our old church, one of the ladies had, uh, she had her baby, and it was great, but childbirth is rough, and I could not find her. But I went by the room four times. I just didn't recognize her. That's not bad. She just looked different. No, the point is what I'm saying is that when we, 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 we come and we talk about the testimonial, it's that this is what I was, this is what it was, and this is, why, and this is what's different. The number one thing that you can do, you can do it with your children and anybody, is tell what your life was like before you submitted to Christ. See, sometimes our, our kids don't really know. They see you as mom and dad, but you can be married and have no joy in the marriage. Well, my mom and, dad, and, and, and the only way you're going to have joy if you're in that situation is both of you have to submit wholly to Christ. That testimony, the testimony is, I didn't, have, I, I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills, but I just prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And guess what? I tell them, I went to the mailbox. I went to the mailbox and I opened up the mailbox, check out, and there was this check. I don't know where the check came from, but there was a check, and I just want to thank God because all I could do is pray. That's a testimony. And when you get that testimony, they're going to say, well, how could you trust like that? And all you can say is, look, man, I'm a follower of Christ, and he promised to meet my needs. And I'm not telling you you're going to get reached, but I tell you this, when you become a child of God, when you follow him, he will meet your needs. Yes. Testimonial. Yes. Next one in Mark, 5, Mark chapter 5, relational. Relational. Mark chapter 5. We have confrontational, we have intellectual, we have testimonial, and we have relational. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. This is a story of the demon-possessed man. And look what he says, Mark chapter 5, verse 18, starting verses 18 and 19. Jesus heals this demon-possessed man. And it says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him. Jesus not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went and began to tell in the capitalist how much Jesus had done, and all the people were amazed. Relational. And all that means is the relations you have on your job, the relations you have with your family members, the relations you have with your children, the relations you have with others who attend this church, those who, who visit the church, that your job is to just tell them. See, relational is, it, it should be easier because if, if they're really your friend, right? then they should be able to listen to you, right? You should be able to talk to them. But you know what the truth is? Sometimes the most people we think are friends aren't our friends because we're afraid to tell them. You're like, well, if I, if I say something about Jesus, then they, they ain't going. The fight came on last night. If I mentioned Jesus, they ain't going to invite me to the fight. That's my fight place. Huh? Huh? If I say something about Jesus, then I won't go to the Michigan Michigan State game and they, they, they ain't going to invite me no more. Huh? I didn't say nothing about Jesus. If you can't say nothing about the Lord, if you can't say really about anything outside, even outside to, to tell them about something that will change your life, then it's not a great relationship. It's not a tight relationship as you think. 
Your type relationship, those relational things are where as like in a marriage or sometimes a wife has to say some things to a husband he don't want to hear. Or a husband will say something to the wife she don't want to hear. Or you say something to your kids that they really don't want to hear. But you tell them that because you care. Jesus said, look, man, your life has been changed. Go tell those others whom you know. The easiest person you should be able to talk to is people you know. You know, it's like going to the family reunion, and we be honest, you go, and you like it. But half the family members you don't even like. Let's tell the truth. <laughs> you know, like, you be like, oh, man, I'm, I can go for a day. I mean, I think my parents love me. I, I know they love me. But you know, my father won't stay at my house longer than two days. He said, two days, and we got to be out. I was like, what's that for? He said, because when you first come, the first 24 hours is excitement. Because you're excited. They see everybody. The next 24 hours, and I was like, oh, this dude about to get on my nerves. Then it, so he said, if you stay past 48 hours, you're in trouble. Now, I don't know about you, so we only stay like 24, 48 hours in all of our family because we don't want to say some things that you can't take back. So the 48-hour rule. But th those things where you have those family members and it's those relational, those, those uh, uh, reunions are an opportunity to stand up and tell your family simply that I love you. All you got to say is, I love you. And then you follow up as, I love you and God loves you. And I want you to know that I hope all of you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. All you have to believe is trust and trust him. If you need to know more, come and talk with me. That's a simple relational thing that you do. The next one would be invitational, John 4. Look at John 4. We got confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, relational, and invitational. John chapter 4. It's the story of the woman at the well. John chapter 4. Look at the uh, last few verses here. He says here in verse 38, starting in verse 38. He says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have come, done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Jesus saw the woman at the well. He engaged her. He invited her to drink from living water and so on. These are invitational is where you have the opportunity to, in a sense, Talk to someone. You may not be the one. You may not be able to give the whole gospel message, but you say, I know a place where you can get it. I know, you know, our church is having an evangelism Sunday. We're having mission Sunday or an outreach day. Why don't you come to there? Because they got a message for you. The next one is serving. Serving. Acts chapter 9. We're at Acts chapter 9. The story of Dorcas. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Acts 9, 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which then translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. Dorcas impacted her city by doing deeds of kindness. And I want to say here, don't ever think you're, you, you, you're, you're not, quote unquote, the greatest Christian because you don't, you're not a person like Peter or Paul or you quote unquote, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a deacon. I can't get up there and just, I don't like to get in front of people and just tell people about Jesus. But you know what? If that's not your way, you can do it by serving others. It's no different than if you, uh, someone, if, if there's a fire and they lose their home and you take, you go to the store and buy them a whole bunch of possessions for their new home. Or if you see somebody who's in need and they need a vehicle and you got five in the driveway and you go to them and say, here, uh, brother, sister, I know you're in need. Here's a vehicle. Get the first thing they're going to say, they're going to be shocked. First of all, they're going to say, does it run? <laughs> uh, you're like, yeah, it run. Well, what year is it? A 19, what year is it? Is it a 19, a 1992? No. God has put up my heart. I know you need a vehicle. I'm going to give you my 2015. Now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you get that 2015. If, well, first of all, you better make sure your husband and wife, you marry, you're in agreement, because that could be rough. But if, if you're in agreement and you get that 2015, guess what? They, they're going to fall back. They're going to be like, what? 
And when you say that I give it to you because God has blessed me and given me things, I want to help you. I know your family. You have the opportunity to serve them. And whatever you say, whether you mumble, whether you can't speak correctly, they are going to listen to your words because you serve them. That's why, that's why churches nowadays, and, and, I, I'm, I, and I know that you guys, they serve in the community. That's what service is all about. That's why it's important to help out, give food to the poor, help the homeless, all those different things serving so that you have the ability to tell people about Christ. You know, it's, uh, you got a, uh, I'm at Syracuse University as a campus director for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so a lot of people, they, they want to come up, they say, Payne, can you get me tickets to the game? Can I go to the football game? And how come coach don't talk to me about this and that? I want to talk to coach, and when I say, hi, coach, just ignore me. I say, because all you're doing is that because you want something. You want, you want access. You want to be sitting in the front row. And the only way that you're going to be able to have a table and be able to talk to these gentlemen is you got to serve them. They got to know that you care about them for who they are, not for their position and their title. So you serve them. What does that mean? You, it means that when you go, you say, hello, coach, I'm praying for you. You serve them. I don't know if you can cook, make something nice and give it to them. Serve them. Write them a letter of encouragement. Serve them. You know, service is probably one of the most important things you can do for your testimony. I mean, it's very hard to listen to someone, right? If Every time it's time to serve, they always get, they're the first one in line. You know, you ever at church cleanup? You at church cleanup? And you, you're just like, yo, we need to be doing that, and we need to get over there, and we need to get that, and the person who's doing all that, they gone. They, they, they're good at delegating, but they ain't doing none of it. My wife says that I do that at the house. I do, too. I ain't cleaning. No, well, all you do is talk, and you, you delegate. You got to serve. Why? We do all those things so that we have the opportunity to tell people about Christ. I'm going to tell you, when you, when, when Bible Baptist as a church, when each one of you is using your area, be it confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, invitational, serving, when you use your gift and you take up the mantle of telling people about Christ, you know what happens in a church? Explosion. Because the Bible tells us there are those who are already going to accept it. We don't know who they are, but we have to share the message. God knows. He's already chosen them. And you get the blessing of leading them to Christ. One of my greatest joys from this church was baptizing my own children in that baptismal. Ain't nothing like it. I baptize a lot of people. But when you get to baptize your own, oh. You know how you love people's kids? I see people, oh, you love people's kids, oh. You know, I keep talking about, but Terrence and them came, my kids, they're like, oh, little Trenton, oh, he, they came up to graduation, oh, little Trenton. And I was like, oh, Trenton, 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 oh, Trenton, Trenton, oh, running around, oh, bring him back. But you know what? When my little daughter born, I'll probably forget his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot not like, yo, man. But we do it all so that we tell others about Christ. We'll end with this, number three. It's your responsibility to learn how to share your faith. So how can they hear about preaching? How can they, unless someone is sent? Your goal when sharing the gospel should not be a presentation, but conversation. And to have a conversation about the gospel, you need to know what the message is from the top to the bottom, beginning to end. Now, I say it's your responsibility. You got a church, you got pastors, you got leaders, they're going to help you learn how to share your faith, Right? But the fine details of what you need to do, you need to take up upon yourself and have some skin in the game and say, look, I'm committed to sharing my faith. I got to learn. I have responsibility in this. Amen. One day a lady criticized D.L. Moody for his methods of evangelism in attempting to win people to the Lord. Moody's reply was, I agree with you. I don't like the way I do it either. Tell me how you do it. The lady replied, I don't do it. Moody replied, then I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it at all. Listen, 
You have a responsibility to figure out a way, how am I going to tell others about Christ? How am I going to tell my children? How am I going to tell my grandchildren? How am I going to tell my aunt, my uncle? How am I going to tell my grandparents? How am I going to tell people on my job? It's your responsibility to do that. And the great thing about it is the Bible says you pray, ask God to give you direction and strength, and he will show you what you need to say. But don't get up there selling. When I was in school, you used to go through a program. They had training programs of how to share your faith. And so you would go door to door and say, do you, how you doing? Hey, my name is, my name is William. Can I ask you a question? And they say, yeah. I say, um, if you were to die today and stand before God, and he say, why well, should I let you in heaven? What would you say? They say, I'm a good person. I say, you know what? You can't do enough good deeds to outweigh the bad. What does it look like you put a, a drop of ink in some water? Does it turn dirty? Yes. That means you can't do enough good deeds to change the bad. How many sins a day do you create? Three. I say, three sins a day is a thousand a year. You're 30 years old, that's 30,000 sins. If you got 30,000 parking tickets, you got stopped by the police, what would happen? Oh, you get pulled over and go to jail. Well, when it comes to salvation, if you got 30,000 trespasses in God, when well, you're going to go straight to hell, you can't do that. And they say, well, what do I do? Well, what do you do? You do this. Jesus loves you. You died on the cross. He wanted to be forgiven for your sin. Can I ask you a question? No. He wanted to die for your cross and he wanted to be forgiven for sin. And all you got to do is believe and have faith. Faith is believing and leaning back and let me catch you. Oh, you got to say, and then you can say. You know, I learned it. I got five different ways I can do it. But you don't sell the gospel. It's not a sales pitch. The gospel is the life changing message that if you were following Christ, it should have changed yours. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, for those who are here who may not, who say, man, this is, this is, I've heard this, but I haven't accepted it. I will tell you this, your life will not be what it needs to be. Your marriage, your children, your finances, your job will not be, you will not be a whole person until you come to know Jesus Christ. And so as a believer, we got to learn to share our faith. The number one reason people don't share their faith, we'll stop right here, is fear. Some people don't want to learn, so they can have an excuse. You know, we got a dishwasher, we got a new dishwasher. My wife said, the man came and showed us how to work it. She said, you want to learn how to? I said, nope. <laughs> no, I don't got to work it. I don't want to learn. Get work done, tile man come, she's into that paint. I don't want to learn how to do any of it. So when she asked me, don't know how. That's how some people do with their faith. They, they don't want to learn the gospel. They don't want to learn nothing. They say, man, I ain't going to, they like, shh. They say, hey, man, come to Sunday school. No, I ain't going there. They might teach me how to share my faith. Well, come to marriage class. We're going to have marriage enrichment. We're going to build marriage. Oh, can't do that. Then I'm going to have to change how I'm doing stuff. Well, you, you know, they don't want to be around, so they have this excuse. People don't share their faith because of fear. The secret to neutralizing fear is to embrace the threatened disaster and count it as not too high a price to pay for obedience to Christ. The attitude of faith may not eliminate the uneasiness and apprehension. It will, however, allow you to go ahead and act in obedience to Christ. The problem of fear is not the fear itself, but the fact that we allow it to immobilize us. Being afraid is no sin. Shrinking back fearfully from obedience is. Fear can stop you in your tracks as a Christian, but it doesn't have to. You can trust God and move ahead in obedience because you understand fear and know how to deal with it. Don't let fear control you. God has mandated that you share your faith. If he's mandated it, then he will give you to the ability to do it. Let us be doers of the word and not hearers only. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to look into your word. We thank you for what Jesus did upon Calvary, Father. And I pray that you are honored and glorified. And I pray for anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ. I pray that today will be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.